as soon as I figure out how to wire myself up here. Normally, I'm taking all that time that y'all are getting to greet each other, but since you greeted each other over breakfast, I don't get to do this. Um, I think I'm about to get it. Um, I got it. So, thank you. I got water, too. My, my son ran and got I made my son run and go get it because I didn't think I was going to have time to get it, and lo and behold, I did, so it made it look like I just made my son go and be a servant to me. And, <clears throat> but I appreciate it very much, Colin. Um, I, I want to say um, to the worship team, um, that was I, I really appreciate the worship leadership this morning. It was wonderful. I, there was just something really missing from that last song, and I think it was Southern. Um, if y'all are any, any of you are used to having Brian Kane here, he's usually the one singing that the lead on that. And uh, something about an Alabama drawl just seems to make it a different song, um, but it's still filled with the with the grace and, of God. It is exciting to be here on a baptism Sunday. Um, I mean, you can stop there. There is a visible expression of the gospel in action. Um, but I'm still going to talk. Um, I'm not going to get away from that. <clears throat> My purpose every time is to introduce to you my God seen in the man Jesus who was tempted in every way as we are but without sin so if you want to know whom to love how to live Jesus is it though he is God he didn't set for himself the goal of lording it over humanity but instead took on the form of a servant he even died a miserable death, buying back the life that we had lost. But though he died, death could not hold him. Death couldn't defeat him. And because of that, he has set us free from everything that saps the life out of us. So it doesn't make any difference what we think of ourselves or what anybody else thinks of us, we are claimed as children of the living God, brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ, and thus full inheritors of the kingdom of God. By the presence of his spirit, we carry Jesus' authority as his ambassadors into a broken and hurting world that needs to hear this message. So forget the robed and the passive, the bearded Jesus you see in Sunday school pictures just for a moment again this morning. And see him as he truly is. By the power of his spirit, meet him. Come here with him. One of the most um, gratifying child interventions I ever did as a counselor was um, dealing with a, there was a, a mother and her seven-year-old son who was diagnosed with oppositional defiant disorder. If you don't know what this is, it's a, uh, kind of a condition that you see in, um, in children and in, in some young people in particular, but it grows into adulthood where uh, they just feel a real need to defy authority. So it's, you watch a lot of rebellious attitude and it drives teachers and parents crazy. So at any rate, this mother was convinced that the seven-year-old was a bad egg. I got all the genes from his dad and would never, never be a good guy again. And I suggested, you know, let's give it a try. Maybe it's learned behavior and not just genes. Let's see what we can do. And the intervention we're going to try is we're going to set up something where the kid can't fail. In other words, we're going to give him three opportunities to obey commands that you give him. And if he doesn't obey them, no punishment. These are going to be really simple things we're going to do right now. But if he does obey them, after he obeys three commands, he gets a reward. And she said, well, this is, this is kind of ridiculous. I don't know where we're going with this. I said, let's just try it. Let's see where we're going. So she called him in. She offered him a reward. It was a, a bowl of ice cream, but it, more important to the boy. She, cause I was saying, what would be a reward to you here? He wanted the bowl of ice cream with her sitting at the table, by the way. Um, he wanted to tell her a joke. And so she said she would listen to him while he ate his bowl of ice cream if he obeyed three commands. So she set out, um, first of all, she kind of threw a wad of paper out on the floor and she said, go pick that up for me, please. And the boy said, what the, no way, I'm not, oh, oh, um, can I try that again? It was, it was the funniest thing to see the expression on his face. He was automatically triggered by a command 
into disobedience. But as soon as he recognized that wasn't what was supposed to happen, he stopped himself and turned around and got to where he wanted to go. Now, it took him five tries before he obeyed three times without questioning. But he did it. And he was so proud of himself. And over time, that boy learned a different method of behavior. So my contention in this is that being needy is a learned behavior. I started a couple of, um, or last week I, I started with the, the, telling the story of the Good Samaritan in the Bible, dealing with the concept of how it relates to needy people. I shared a picture that Christians, uh, that, that most of us have, or many of us have grown up with, that Christians are supposed to bend over backwards to help every person in need, and that that may not entirely be correct. That may be a learned behavior that doesn't quite fit exactly what the gospel depicts. It's reaction, like that boy was reacting to commands, it's reaction to just automatically do something uh, without thinking about it or without having a choice. It's opposed to responding, where you can think through the situation and choose an appropriate action. So when people come to us sometimes demanding help, we may, they may be punching our buttons and we just respond. Now Jesus told that story about a man who was beaten and robbed and left for dead beside the road. Other religious leaders passed him by, but a despised foreigner was the one who stopped and helped and cared for the man's wounds, gave him a, a ride to the closest inn, and then paid for his room and board for a long time to come. And my suggestion is that the context in which Jesus told that story is indicating that we are to identify ourselves with a beaten man more than with a Samaritan. Our primary command is to receive what Jesus has done for us and consequently to recognize that Jesus is alone is our Savior. That's, that was the concept I was dealing with last, last week. In comparison to Jesus in particular, all of us are needy people. And primarily, all of us need Jesus. Okay? That was the idea. Now, if we can focus on that reality that we are people who need Jesus and need his grace, then my contention is we are set free. We are not obligated to rescue anyone, hold anyone's hand, or make a single person happy because Jesus is the one who does the saving. This is not our job to save people. It is God's job to save people. We are set free from that. This perspective disconnects our buttons and leaves us free to respond rather than to react. But I left off last week with the idea that we could just say no to needy people, but I didn't leave off with what we could say yes to. In other words, is just saying no really responding? Just to let you know, when I first felt free of being anybody's savior, I was still a pastor. And my first response was to exercise that freedom in its utmost because it felt so good. And so somebody would come and say, you know, Pastor Thomas, um, uh, my brother is in the hospital and I think it would really do him a world of good if you went to visit with him. You should have a pastor come and visit with him. And I would say, why? Only Jesus alone saves. That's all he needs. Uh, it didn't work very well, Dave. Not a very loving attitude, right? Um, so my contention is that just saying no, if it's a reaction to avoid all that, is the flip side of the same coin because we're still reacting, we're not responding. Does that make sense? So what we are seeking is a way of inter being able to engage with people without constantly being triggered by people. And I don't think we can do that as long as we are responding to people. We can only do that when we respond to God. God's call on us, God's life in us, God's life between us. When that becomes the reality is when we are set free. This actually requires more work than just saying yes. Or just saying no. It requires us to figure out how we interact. We have to learn new behaviors 
inside of Jesus' grace. Jesus has set us free, but it's more than just saying no. It's the freedom to choose yes to things that are good and helpful between us. So we are always reacting unless we're responding to God. And I say that when we respond to God, we'll be able to see it in three things. And I'm going to give these to you uh, right up front, and you'll know pretty much the rest of my sermon here. Okay, we are set free to see the loving Father in the most difficult interpersonal relationships. We are free to see the loving Father in the most difficult interpersonal relationships. Second, we are free to see the people that God has given to us to be in fellowship with one another. And three, we are set free to fulfill the assignments that God gives us in life. Okay? I want to share with you a story to which I imagine a lot of us will relate. And because the folks in the back, have, I didn't give them a list of scriptures, I'm sorry. The first, this is going to start in John 6. And while I'm telling about it, it's, I'm going to, going to pick up to actually read beginning in verse 35. So if you want to have... John 6, 35 through 38, ready. I'll get down there. And there are going to be a few other verses past that in John that I'm going to read. Um, and I'll give you a little advance warning for it. So I hope that helps you. Um, this story uh, in Jesus' life is not one of the happiest ones. And it begins after he has miraculously fed over 5,000 people on the hillside, multiplied loaves and fishes till everybody had their fill and there was lots left over. And after that took place, this huge crowd around him on, in a barren area on the northern side of Lake Galilee, um, Jesus leaves at night. His disciples leave by boat, but Jesus stays with the crowd. But at night, Jesus goes walking across the water, joins his disciples, another great miracle, gets to shore at Capernaum. The next morning, the crowd gets up, finds out Jesus is gone. They go racing around the lake and across the lake any way they can get there to get back to Capernaum. And they start asking Jesus lots of questions like, how did you get here? You know, what's, you know, tell us all about this. But Jesus said, you're looking for me. Not because you want to be with me. You're looking for me because you ate your fill yesterday and you want more today. You're needy people. And they say, you know, pretty much plainly, um, well, you know, way back during Moses' day, God fed the the people in the wilderness uh, on manna actually said back in Moses' day, the people in the wilderness were fed bread and, and they fed manna from heaven every day for 40 years. So they're kind of implying, Jesus, if you really are from God, you're going to feed us every day for the next 40 years. That's the implication. So this is what Jesus says to them in, in starting in John 6, 35. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life whoever comes to me shall not hunger and whoever believes in me shall never thirst he's reiterating what what i was sharing last week a relationship with jesus will supply every need of ours even hunger and jesus continues but i said to you that you have seen me and yet you do not believe all that the father gives me will come to me and whoever comes to me i will never cast out You'll be with me for more than 40 years if what you want is me. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Jesus is saying yes to the Father in the relationship he is having with that crowd. I am not choosing to feed you with more loaves and fishes right now i am feeding you even more out of what god has provided me but if you don't believe sorry there's a yes and no taking place here jesus saying yes to the father and his will no to all the people and their demands does that make sense it's not just no i don't want to have anything to do with your man demands it's yes, I'm agreeing to the Father. This is what, um, one of the things that Brian Kane, we talked about Brian and his work here, um, and Dave came up with a name for it. What would you call it? His, he, 
he operated from a resting position. Was that what you call it? This resting position in which it's really hard to ruffle him. And, and part of the reason is because when he'd stand in those relationships with people and people were trying to argue with him, or you know, he could say, what is the Father's will in this place? I think if we can get to that place where we can say, what is the Father doing here? that we are so much more free as we respond to the most difficult interpersonal relationships with the Father's perspective on it, we are resting. We're not uptight about what's going to happen, right? And it's peaceful. No matter how loud and angry they get. Now, I tell you where this is really hard is if we, you're with your parents... I don't care how old you are. If your parent starts to yell at you, what does it feel like? It doesn't feel like you're in a resting position. The people who are closest to us are the ones who usually trigger us the most. If you're dealing with somebody who has an addiction, they tend to trigger us the absolute most because the addiction will never shut up. But can you get to the resting position? What's God's perspective? What's God doing in here? That changes it. We are fearfully and wonderfully made by a loving Father in His image. We are called by His name. We were redeemed by Jesus' death, and our adoption papers as children of God were signed by the Holy Spirit. Right? Reacting is when we are driven by what's happening around us, listening to our fears, our angers, our lusts, our egos, their anger, their demands, their lusts, their egos. Responding, though, is when we watch what God is doing, looking at the world through the Father's eyes, listening for his voice. There is no true freedom to respond, again I tell you, unless we are responding to what God is doing between us. The danger, of course, is that the people want us to react to them. If we were responsive to God instead of to them, aren't they going to get angry? Hmm, well, that story that I was reading from in John continues. I'm going to, going to get down here a little bit further. Jesus says, and I don't have the verse here, so I'm going to, going to leave this to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. And he's saying he's referring to the sharing in his own death, which is to come. So that he's saying something to them that they're not truly going to understand now. But this is what we saw symbolized in baptism this morning, going under the water, coming back up again, is that when we go under the water, we represent dying to ourselves and, and in him, and then also rising to life in him. And in part, what we're saying is we're dying to reactiveness, we're rising to responsiveness in what we're doing. And of course, as I said, the people don't get it. They hear this as some kind of cannibalism and they get grossed out by it. They eat flesh, drink blood. And so then comes this curious interchange. Now, beginning in John 6, 61, going through 66. This is the last of my verses that I'm going to be doing here. John 6, 61. But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, said to them, Do you take offense at this? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But there are some here who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who those were who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. And he said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted to him by the Father. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So obviously there is a risk in our relationship when we stick closely to living this gospel message of salvation and abundance in God through Jesus alone. If we really believe it's true, then there are those who will never be satisfied with the fact that we do not give them what they want. They may be our neighbors, our friends, our classmates, our co-workers, even our own family members. 
We recognize that what they need, they can only get from Jesus. We point to Jesus, and the more we point, the more they get offended, you know? Friends, I want to tell you that if we live this true freedom in Christ, we have less reactivity, but working out those details does get more complex. Because we have to start learning a whole new way of interacting. We're going to start by saying the wrong things, doing the wrong things, but we're going to become more responsive to God as we learn. We're going to become more responsive to who God has called us to be with. And this is my second point. Many people left Jesus, but some people didn't. John 6, 67. I I said I was at the end, but I wasn't. Sorry about that. 67 through 69. So Jesus said to the twelve, Do you want to go away as well? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom will we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. I don't know how it would feel to you to find two-thirds of the people who were following you leaving and one-third saying to you, you know, who else would we go to? But these are the people Jesus was called to be with. These are the people Jesus later on would pray and said, Lord, you have given these to me. And not a single one of them has been lost except for the one who would betray him. Jesus knew who he was supposed to be with. Way to go. By the Holy Spirit, we can know too. Jesus said he came that we may not just have survival, but abundant life. And all those people who wanted more food were geared toward survival. The disciples Jesus chose were geared toward life. They didn't understand it all. They didn't get it right two-thirds of the time. They weren't the smartest people. They were not the, the most savvy on religious matters. That wasn't the issue. God brought them together. And God has people who were designed for us. We are not called to relate to every single person in the world. But you may be surprised who you're called to relate to. And figuring that out is part of the complexity of what's going on in here. This is what we're free to do. I absolutely love being around people who are primed for seeing their lives change as they come to know their potential in Jesus. They may not even recognize that they are primed for change, but somehow I sense it. I don't always get it right, and sometimes it takes several meetings before we start to really mesh a relationship together. And if they aren't motivated, well, strangely enough, I find myself not motivated to hang around them for a a long time. I'll I'll keep talking to them politely and things. It's just the depth of the relationship will not be part of my priority there. I can't make deep relationships with every one of you. I'm sorry about that. But there are people over time that I get drawn to at different stages of of your life. And I believe those are things God puts together. So we're free to say yes to the relationships God gives to us. And the third thing we're free to respond to are our assignments given by the Spirit based upon our gifts, our passions, and God's call. And here's an example of how Jesus goes about it. I'm going to be sharing from Luke 12, just a couple of verses here. Luke 12, verses 13 and 14. Luke 12, 13 and 14. Cheryl, I am so glad that you're so adaptable back there. Jesus is in the middle of teaching, and it says, Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who made me a judge or an arbitrator over you? Sounds like rudeness on Jesus' part, doesn't it? Almost like me saying to that person who's asking me to go visit their brother in the hospital, you know, all he needs he can get in Jesus. But in this passage, there's an understanding that one of the functions of the teachers of the law, and Jesus was considered a teacher of the law, is that they settle disputes. That was part of Jewish culture. Jesus is considered here one who should help settle legal disputes because ultimately the inheritance is spelled out in Scripture. 
And Jesus, knowing the scripture, is supposed to come and tell them what to do in places like this. So there is an expectation that goes with this, not just, um, you know, a, a needy demand. But Jesus understands he's being triangulated into this argument. And in counseling terms, triangulation happens whenever I'm having a dispute with somebody else and I go find a, a third person to be on my side and we come and strong arm the other person I'm in a dispute with, two against one. Jesus understands that if he settles this dispute, this guy may get his inheritance, but he's going to lose his brother. The key to what Jesus says is in that word arbitrator. In Greek, it has the same root word as the word to divide. So when he says, tell my brother to divide my inheritance with me, he said, who made me a divider between you? Between you two, not in the inheritance. Jesus understands that fulfilling the man's wish would further damage the relationship with the brother. Jesus says, I am not a divider. The implication is that Jesus is a reuniter. Paul wrote in Corinthians, he said that God was in Christ reconciling, reuniting the world to himself. Jesus understood his assignment as a reuniter so clearly that it made him immune to being used and abused by other people in those triangulation things that we can get into in life. He lived out his assignment in a way that helped him say no. I'm going to use the elders as, as a, an example of what I see this in my own life. I, they asked me to come meet with them once, and I said, what are you meeting about? And it was sort of like, well, what difference does it make? Don't you want to come meet with us? And I said, if you're going to meet and talk about building issues, I have no business being there. That's not my call. But if you're meeting to talk about transformation issues in the life of the church, I'm there in a heartbeat. And matter of fact, I'll skip work to come meet with you. I, I feel really clear about my call in working in transformation. Florence Nightingale is considered the founder of modern nursing. Uh, she was passionate about caring for the sick. She saw that as her her Christian call, her assignment. When she took over a hospital in Turkey, the mortality rate there was 32%. By the time she left a couple of years later, it was 2%. When she came, this was most of the people who were in that hospital at the time were British soldiers fighting in the Crimean War. So when she came home to England again, she was a hero. Everybody wanted her attention. There were politicians who wanted her to come and speak for, on their behalf. There were people in her church and community who wanted to take up religious ideas. There were, there were just huge demands on her life. And she said no to every one of them, but continued doing research on sanitation and its impact on, on health care and advocating with doctors and hospitals. She worked tirelessly until her death to improve these things. She knew what her call was and stuck with it. Now I know it says, it sounds so easy when I say, let's respond to God, let the Spirit choose relationships, you'll follow your assignment, but disconnecting triggers like that boy that I told you about at the beginning can be hard work. The law has primed us to react when we received grace, we spend the rest of our lives relearning how to live. We are children. Discipleship is really happening when we are experimenting in those relationships with one another. Brian, in reading this message this past week, uh, gave me a good sports analogy, and it was so good. I thought I'd share it with you in spite of the fact you've probably heard plenty of sports analogies from Brian, and they all deal with baseball, of course. So, but I want to share this. He said, I'm reminded of watching my grandson trying to learn to hit a baseball. He swings the bat over and over, missing more often than he hits it, but he never seems to get tired of trying. I've watched adults try to learn to play guitar. I have yet to see an adult learn to play guitar. They get tired of the slow progress and they give up. A child seems to never get tired of trying to do something they want to do. Our mistake as Christians is that we think we are adults and that we should already know how to do everything. We approach God thinking we're adults and when we can't do what it is we think we're supposed to do, we tire of failing, we give up. But if we realize that we are his children, then we wait patiently 
keep trying what it is we think he is calling us to do. We try, we mess up, we try again. We keep trying as long as it takes. Building relationships, making disciples, learning from others and are all experimental in nature. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but the child of God keeps pursuing, keeps trying in spite of the number of failures. And you know why we can do that? It's because in Christ, our forgiveness is already guaranteed. It is not punishment anymore to fail. Therefore, needy people are our best classrooms. The people who irritate you the most can be the people who teach you the most because they're going to draw out your triggers. And I'm going to tell you this for the umpteenth time here. We are all needy people at the level of sin. And because of that, all of us have some place where we're needy to somebody else. We all bug somebody. And it's okay. At the same point in time, there are some people who bug me more than others. And one of the things I'm learning is they're a gift. They're pointing out where I can learn. They're pointing out where I'm still not free. And I causes me to go back and say to God, what is the truth that will set me free here? Because I don't want to react to people in need. I want to respond to people in need because only when I'm responding am I helping out of the abundance that you've given me, God. That story, just to end this, pull this all back together, that story of the Samaritan who helped the beaten man on the side of the road, you know, every, every story has two sides to it. I mean, every, every story that Jesus tells has more than one interpretation. Let me put it that way. He wanted the man to see you're supposed to be like the beaten man at the side of the road. Accept what I have to offer. Because it is only out of that that you can be willing to become like the Samaritan. That in the way you help, you may be despised and reviled. But you are truly helping. Because of that, I say hallelujah for needy people. But even more, hallelujah to the Christ who teaches me how to help in a way that makes a difference. Amen. Um, one of the things that you learn, I mean, you can't help from a position where you feel like your value, your worth comes from your helping. Because if you do, you're using and abusing the people you're trying to help. You're getting identity from them. Um, I understand that Ms. Curto felt like she had a word from God, right? Is that correct? And I'm, is it okay if I just share that? Because that, it was shared with me by Tim. She said she felt like there was somebody here today who just does not feel their worth. They don't understand their worth in God. Am I getting that right? Um, I think it's quite possible. This is a truth I want you to know. What Jesus has done has already set up salvation for you. Like the beaten man, the best you can do is accept what's been done for you. Your worth will come out of that. Your ability to relate with others in a way that makes a difference will come out of that. Anybody who wants to talk about it with one of the elders, there's uh, Dave, there's Tim, I can Diz, raise your hand if you feel you can talk to somebody about their worth in Christ. Just raise your hand if you feel like, feel okay about doing that, having that conversation. All right, you can talk to any of these people here. Very good, thank you, I appreciate that too, Laura. And, and I'm up here as well. Let me pray with you quickly. Lord God, thank you indeed that you have provided all that we lack. I thank you, God, that you are, that you're, abundance is more than we can ever run to the end of and I thank you God that you give us the capacity to say yes in places where we've longed and desired to say yes to say no in those places that are appropriate and find in all of that the peace that passes understanding in the relationships that we have all around us God give us your eyes your insight 
Give us a clear understanding of our call. Give us a clear picture when we meet people that these are people you've put together with us. We ask for all of this insight that we may respond to you. Yes, yes, yes. Amen. You are dismissed. <laughs>